All right, let me see. Uh, it would be a Rodney Rodchata Aquino profile, though. Oh, yeah. How many do you have, eh? Uh, three. <laughs> Rodney Rochata Aquino. And it says that you are live. Is that what it says? Yay. I just give you a like. Okay, there you go. Okay, cool. Yay. So, okay, so I guess, yeah. Uh, let me see here. <laughs> it is live. Anyways. <laughs> uh, Yay. Yeah, we're recording. How are you, dude? I haven't seen you in a while. I know, man. A long time. Last time I've seen you was at the SFIBF. I don't know which year that was. What year was it? You and, uh, you and Gabriela. You came to the 10th year anniversary. So I came to the anniversary, and then after that, you went to my... To your anniversary. anniversary right? Yeah. And that okay. was the last time we saw each other in person. Yeah. 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 How many years ago was that? Three years? 10 years ago. So that would have been three years ago, because it would have been... Tw no, two years ago, because it would have been 12 now, right? It would have been the 12th uh, anniversary the now for me. Oh, yeah. For you, 13. Mm -hmm. You know, but for me, it's 12, because... You did your festival 2008. I did my festival 2009. Yeah. Um, you know, I, Nestor I was just here. Um, what's the energy like there, bro? I, I mean, our friend, um, our friend is uh, is g going to be sick. Yeah. Well, uh, if you ask, the, uh, uh, when we talk that part, uh, I'm speaking for myself, but I guess I can speak for the part of the Sydney dance community. Yeah. And the Australian dance community. It was uh, very shocking. It was a very shocking news to hear that Nestor Manuelian was diagnosed with first stage four bowel cancer. Not just cancer, it was, it's stage four. Stage four, yeah. So it was shocking because, uh, like we say, it's like a, he's one of the superheroes here in Australia and in the world of dancing. And yeah. the superheroes don't die, to put it that way. You yeah, know. well, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce this guy first. I know many of you okay. know him already. <laughs> uh, he is the co-founder and co-creator of the very first Bachata Festival in the world, which is the Sydney Bachata Festival. And to his credit, he taught uh, uh, Nestor Bachata. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> <laughs> Even Nestor mentioned that on the, on the yeah. last podcast that we have, <laughs> which is now... Uh, my first question is, I know you're a shy, uh, shy town guy, right? You came from Chicago. Yeah. What the hell were you thinking going to Sydney? And when did you decide to live in Sydney? So my story goes back before Chicago. I was, I am from Ecuador. And then from Ecuador, I moved to, uh, to do my university. Yeah. To Chicago. And the move from Ecuador to the United States is like, it's very common because people just look up to the map. We want to go to the, live the American dream. So it was yeah. like, okay, let's go to uh, the United States, you know? And my mother was like, son, I believe in you. You can go far in life. And I was <laughs> like, yeah, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the United States. So that's when I went to Chicago. And actually I learned my first steps, my first proper dancing steps in, in Chicago. Mm. Because as a good Latino, I believed I knew how to dance. Right. <laughs> but I, I never knew the steps properly. Anyway, that's a different story. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, when I was in Chicago, I graduated. I was working. And, and actually, my company over there, they offered me a PR uh, to stay with them. But that means I had to stay with them for six to seven years until the PR gets processed. Right. And I was working some ridiculous hours there. I was just doing uh, a lot of work and the commute was a lot. So I was like, uh, should, do I stay here and get my PR in the United States? But then I had to be working ridiculous hours for seven years more. Or I followed the advice that my mom told me that I, I'm going to go far in life. So I was like, OK, how far can I go? I open the map and then I look at Australia. Australia is very far. So I was like, I'm going to go far. I'm going to Australia. And that's it, man. Honestly, there's no particular reason why I chose Australia. 
there. I was like, I just need to and, go and, and why Sydney in the first place? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, Sydney, because it was the only city I knew of Australia at that time. Uh-huh. I didn't know any other. I didn't know anything about Australia. I just knew Sydney, Opera House, and I was like, I'm going to go there. And then uh, here I came. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know nothing about the country. I just like, I just like, oh, yes, I need to, I need to leave. And, and then I came. Wow. Okay, yeah. So, and then you met Nestor. I mean, w was that your first day or you just basically searched, hey, where can I find bachata in this city? <laughs> yeah. So at that time, I was just to give credit, you know? Yeah. I was dancing in Latin street dancing in Chicago with Andres Meneses. He oh, okay. was a, All right. All yeah. right. I'm sure you, you guys know that. Yeah. 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 So um, I did two years of Latin dancing with them and then I came to Australia. And then I was uh, already like, you know, when dancing is so important. Yeah. So yeah. before I actually look my accommodation, so I was uh, near to a Latin dance school. I didn't know which Latin dance school was better, was worse. You know, I just said, where can I dance salsa in Sydney, in the city? Yeah. At that yeah. time in Google. And then it showed that a uh, Latin dance Australia was very close to my university. Uh, University of Sydney. So then I, I book accommodation very close to my, to these two locations. Mm. That was it. No, I didn't know Nesto. I didn't know Jamie. I didn't know nothing about Latin dance as well. So I arrived to Sydney. I went to my university orientation because I was doing my master's degree in Australia. And then the next day, uh, the third day, I went to Latin dance Australia LDA because I wanted just to dance. But I didn't have any money, like I didn't have much money because I was just putting all my money into the, into the studies. Right. So then I went to the studio to Latin Dance Australia and yes, it, my intention was to introduce myself, let them know that I'm the new guy in town, that I love dancing, that if they need a body to practice on or anything, I can volunteer or help to count on me. Yeah. Uh, so I went there and the one who opened the door at LDA was Nestor. Nestor and I opened the door, hey, what, who are you? And I said, my LDA at that time was uh, uh, owned by uh, uh, Oliver Pineda, no? No, no, LDA was uh -huh. owned by Jamie and Marcia. Oh, got it, got it, got it, yeah. Yeah, La Latin Motion is Oliver Pineda. Oliver Pineda, which yeah. he managed for a short while, correct? Uh, Nestor, Nestor moved to Latin Motion, yeah. Sure. Okay, later. got it, got it, yeah. Yeah, so that's my story. That's how I met Ernesto. Ernesto has been very uh, charismatic and friendly. He right away, oh, you love dancing. And kind of like, oh, you're from Chicago. You're from overseas. You, you might know something that we don't know. <laughs> you know, so like, oh, yeah, come to the classes. And then uh, he, the same day, he's like, well, I'm going to go dancing tonight. So come with me. I'll introduce you to everybody. And off I went. He was my first dancing friend in, yeah. in Australia. The one that introduced me to a lot of people in the community. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I know that Chicago is uh, one of the few city at the time that loves bachata. What, yeah. was, the, what was the scene like the, uh, at that time, bro? I mean, obviously you caught it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what was the scene like there? Was it kind of modern, moderna-ish, traditional-ish type? Yeah, so I like to say that we all learn like, and then it was just focused on the hip movement. Few turn patterns, but it was more close and in the hip movement. That was that was the most important part. Um, so when I joined, uh, I joined Latin dance, uh, Latin street dancing, and then uh, one year of dancing, I loved it, and then these guys opened uh, uh, auditions to become part of the team, to become part of the team, to perform, to teach, to go to gigs. So the schools were different as what they are now. Now we have multiple teams, but right. at that time there was only one team, you know? So then I auditioned because I, I, was, a, I was in love with salsa. Salsa was the king, even though there was still bachata, but salsa was the king, you know? Yeah. Uh, they used to go to a nightclub that would play a lot of salsa, a bit merengue, a bit bachata, and then back to salsa. So the merengue was to get the drink, and the bachata was to get the girl. 
because you could dance close to her. Yeah. <laughs> and then the salsa was to dance. So, so I was like, okay, I have the opportunity to be part of the, of the team, of the, you know, the professional team. So I did audition. Yeah. They accept me in it. So I was part of the, of the professional team. Yeah. And then the first choreography performance, the choreography that we need to learn for a performance was not salsa, was bachata. It was bachata. And I was yeah. like, what the heck? I, yeah. I, I want to dance salsa, but then they said, no, we need to do a bachata because it's getting popular, blah, blah. It really taught me my bachata steps. And I hated it at the beginning. Oh, hello. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I hated it. Yeah, yeah. And I hated it because I was not good at the body movement in bachata. And I remember I learned a routine, but I was like counting the days for this to finish. <laughs> so then I just can't, we can focus on salsa because that was my, my love. And we did the bachata routine and everything. I learned my bachata steps and okay, it was salsa. But then bachata was, okay, I just used it, you know, for other. Right, reasons. for other yeah. stuff, yeah. But also, so that was my story in the United States with bachata. Now, uh, let's give a shout out to Jorge Lasanto here. He's saying, saying hi. Uh, hey, Jorge. As, as you know, Jorge is our partner in crime when we collaborated. Uh, if, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know the story, <laughs> you should know it now. Um, yeah. I went to Sydney Bachata Festival in 2008 in uh, Juan and, and uh, Nestor and Skye's uh, very first bachata festival, there was Sydney Bachata Festival when I taught there. And they got me, they got me inspired and say, one of these days, I'm gonna have to do this in the United States. And sure enough, after that festival, uh, Juan here um, Facebooked me and said, bro, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to Bay Area, man. It's like you have anything for me? You think you could you could uh, host a workshop or something? It's like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure we could do something. So that was the plan. Um, and yeah, he didn't know this, but uh, I had some epiphany and some type of ideas. Like I called Jorge. I was like, Jorge, Juan is going to be in the Bay Area. He's gonna do. A, I'm hosting him for a boot camp. Um, I think we should do a festival, man. I think we're just gonna have to do a festival. I was like, yeah, let's do it. Um, and so that was the decision, right? I told you, okay, we're gonna do San Francisco, bro, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, after a few weeks, I had this idea, I was like, hey, bro. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a little uncertain about San Francisco, man. You think you, think you wanna do it in Reno? Let's try it in Reno first. Let's try it in a small city with cheaper hotels. Uh, and let's 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 start from there and see how they respond. And sure enough, we had this collaboration with BB. I called BB and was like, BB, I'm gonna do a festival there, man. Uh, if you want to join or not, you should join because you're the godfather of salsa there. You know, I was like, so he agreed, and so we had yeah. this collaboration among the four of us. That's uh, that's also the time I met my future wife in that festival. I, was there, man. I, was I there remember in the room. we were partying in your room, bro. Yeah, yeah. It was my room. It was you your own room. You owe me, man. You owe me your festival. You owe me your wife. <laughs> <laughs> we did it at the Grand Sierra Hotel, which, uh, uh, which very fortunate now that I do the Reno Dance Expo there. Uh, at that time, Mm -hmm. Grand Sierra Hotel was not that good, I think. It was like, uh, it wasn't rated high, but now it's actually the number one hotel in this area. Uh, mm -hmm. But that was the history, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, you know, um, what made you go to the Bay Area, by the way? Did I invite you or that, did, what happened? Um, so because I, from the United States, I moved to Australia. Yeah. I have family in Chicago. I oh, God. My sister You're was there. Them, yeah. My brother was there. My mother lived in Indiana. Yeah. So I was, I was going to go visit them. And I had yeah. to stop. Uh, there was flights from Sydney to San Francisco, Chicago, and then back. So that was like, uh, do it. Might as well. Let's, let's, uh, make some, let's do something about it. So yeah. before, before all of this festival, bro, before all of this festivals happened, <clears throat> before the, the idea even could happen, did you ever think you are going to be hosting a festival? Did you ever think you are going to be teaching bachata at all? Oh, no, man. 
<laughs> I saw me teaching salsa. Yeah, <laughs> that's what right. I saw me. <laughs> yeah. That's what I saw me. I'm going to be teaching salsa, and I never thought about I would make it. Uh, I'm, 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 um, I live out of dancing at the moment. I've been doing it for 10 years. And I never thought that I was going to be a professional dancer living out of events or yeah. uh, classes, traveling, yeah. teaching. No, that's something that just grew organically. You know, I just took the risk and I just went, went for it. What was mm. your feeling like when we were doing that festival in Sydney in 2008 and you were seeing all of these people coming from all over the world? What was the feeling <laughs> like amongst the three of you? Yeah, but I just want to add for all the viewers because I yeah. probably think that I'm going to, um, I'm a salsero who just saw bachata as an opportunity. And I'm, <laughs> so let me, oh, you want to debunk into, that myth. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me go back into how I fell in love with bachata. <laughs> and then I decided for bachata to be my first dance. <laughs> uh, okay, otherwise, <clears throat> I don't, I don't mean, I don't want to be categorized as the salsero who is using bachata to get popular. Because right, that right, was right, it. right. That wasn't me. <laughs> all right, so, all right, let me go. Let's go back in history, 2004. What was the feeling I'm like, through. bro? I mean, I know you guys were thinking just to have a, a, a good party, right? But then yeah. when it was happening, like let's say Saturday and Saturday night yeah. already, what are you guys were talking about? What were you feeling? Yeah, uh, we actually started to see like, wow, we are creating something that we don't know when uh, more schools wanted to join or event to put it that way or the event when we have more schools wanting to join and then we had to open a second night yeah because just to accommodate everybody and then when we got your email saying that you want to come and check it out yep. and yep. we got anoop's email and then we have people from new zealand new zealand as well wanted to all come. of we these teachers like, oh. are emailing you <laughs> yeah we're like a uh wow it's, it's good it's a it's a bachata event but now <laughs> it's, it's becoming a, a festival yeah. You know? So we were not planning to, we were not planning to host a festival, but then it just grew and then we decided, okay, let's just make it an official uh, a festival. So I think we have you know what? We have to thank social media that gigs hasn't it been for Facebook with where all of these teachers uh, and powers that be has seen that, they would have never emailed you or anything, you know? Oh a hundred percent, man. So at that time it was YouTube was first and then social media and then Facebook. <laughs> yeah, MySpace was before that. <laughs> but I was not part of MySpace, man. I, I was too, too, too young for that. I was part of MySpace. I think I still have an account in MySpace. I am that old. <laughs> I remember that you had a massive MySpace presence. I had I like I, I, I had like 13,000 followers yeah. on, on MySpace, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my space is where I met Alejandro Rey, you know, remember Hondo, right? Yeah. yeah I met yeah. Alejandro Rey and he, he sent me his video, you know, one of his choreography where he playing the ukulele, you know how big he is, right? Yeah, and yeah. then he plays the ukulele guitar doing bachata with partner and everything. It's like, hey, what do you think, Rodney? You know? <laughs> uh, That's how I met him. That's also how uh, I met Zeke. Uh, yeah, Zeke through my space. In, in my space, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, for those young generations, before we used to um, brag about the number of followers we have in MySpace. They're like, this is me, and I have 10,000 followers on MySpace. It doesn't <laughs> count anymore. <laughs> and, then, and then we brag about the number of views we have on YouTube. Yeah. This is me, and I have millions of views on YouTube. Yeah. And then we brag about how many followers in Facebook. Facebook, yeah. And I have yeah. followers in Instagram. Oh, man. <laughs> But then, but then we brag, it's like, hey, man, I got over 10,000. Oh, man, yeah, I got over 13,000. And then Ataka Lalimana came. And then uh, 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 even Christian Sola, for that matter, uh, with, his, yeah. with his first central video. And uh -huh. then uh, who else? Uh, uh, Daniel uh, Carlos Cinta, came. Carlos yeah. Cinta, one of his videos from Carlos Cinta, he was doing turn patterns. Carlos yeah, Cinta, was, too. He was yeah. doing salsa pattern and bachata. <laughs> yeah, and that, you know, he was doing it turn patterns to look more it was salsa patterns but he made it look more bachata -ish. and yeah i used to follow him so i brought him to us i actually called him from australia and say dude you don't know me but i follow you on youtube and i love your style and you like, <laughs> style of what I'm like bachata I'm like okay so what you want like i want you to come to australia to my festival and he's like dude uh i never done this pretty much i i i took carlos 
Sinta from wherever he was in Chicago to uh, Australia, and yeah. then his career just poof, exploded. Dude, uh, I remember, because I believe he went to Australia the first time on the second Bachata Festival, right? He went there, and mm -hmm. then he went again, whether it was at that Bachata Festival or he went again, that he got inspired by Moro and... Uh, <clears throat> What's her, uh, what was her former, uh, what was his? Moro and Alegria. Moro and Alegria, and they hang out together, and all of a sudden, after that trip, I see him doing yeah. all of this Dominican stuff. I was like, what the fuck happened? You know, Who are like, you? <laughs> he, he had like 360 degree turn, you know? I was like, awesome, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and let's then... get curious about Bachata Moderna, bro, because I know who your influ influences are. Uh, so tell me your influences in Bachata Moderna, and I know I'll give you a lot of credit for structuring, mm, structuring okay. Bachata Moderna. So give me your, who are, who are your influences then? And what was your thought process structuring Bachata Moderna? Mm -hmm. So um, I was, when I came to Chicago, when I came to Australia, I started to teach Bachata. Yeah. Uh, because there was no Bachata at all in Sydney. So I was yeah. like, oh, I have this little flower here. So let me, let me introduce people to bachata. And then I decided, you know what? Let's leave salsa to the side. There are too many salsa instructors. They are fighting for the top, let them fight. Yeah. Uh, somebody needs to look after bachata. So I started <clears throat> the bachata movement here in Australia. I didn't plan it, but it just happened. And, but bachata wasn't much developed. It was yeah. just dance together, a lot of hip movements, uh, one pattern, once again, together. So when I started teaching it, everybody was like, yeah, let, you know, it's, let's learn to new dance. But then uh, my knowledge at that time, we're talking about 2004, 2006, just kind of plateau. Right. <clears throat> there was no more to, to create. We were just creating uh, patterns with the same limitations. Uh, that it, just, it was just, you know, when you try to put too much the decorations on a cake, it just doesn't look the same. It just like, it just looks, eh. Yeah. But then I felt that I was getting to a plateau of my knowledge. And I was like, there has to be something more with the dance that, that we can do. Yeah. Uh, not just side to side, because before the movement was just side to side. Side to side, close connection, turn pattern, turn pattern, side to and side. And side to side, yes. <laughs> yes, side to side. Maybe just go around yeah. with your partner. And, and so yeah. I kind of just felt like I have nothing else to teach. I have taught everything. And then I went to uh, Malaysia. Oh. I used to um, I used to watch videos on YouTube. I was you know trying to get inspired at that time. YouTube was the king in social media, and it was this guy Iñaki Fernandez yes. with a video to Susana Montero. I met him, bro. I, I met Iñaki. He's a very cool guy. Yeah. So yeah. Iñaki Iñaki Fernandez and Susana Montero on Montero, a, yeah. uh, on a freestyle that they did in somewhere, uh, maybe Spain somewhere. And the song as well wasn't like the traditional, it was kind of more like a newer bachata at we, that time. We were questioning at that time, that was uh, by Toque de Queda, no? Yes, yeah, yeah. correct. <laughs> and, but the steps that they were doing, honestly, at that time, wasn't like, a, was not bachata at that yeah. time with the knowledge that we have. Yeah. And then, but that was like, that's cool. I like it. They're keeping the four beats, but they're adding more things. So. It always intrigued me, like, uh, mm, this guy is doing something else. Oh, and then when I was invited to go to Malaysia, to the Malaysian festival, yeah. he was there as well. So I was, I was teaching my bachata stuff, you know, my bachata stuff and everything. And then I went to see his workshop. And then he taught uh, the cross on one. Yes. He didn't call it a cross on one. I think he called it some, something else. Probably uh, something but, else in Spanish. <laughs> yeah, they call it the, the, the Madrid style. Right. At that time, the, which were Italian used to or, or a Spanish style, yeah. Oh, right? uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, I remember he, loved, he called it the, the, the Madrid style. And then there was a fight with Pablo Vilches and Iñaki, who started the Madrid style, uh, who created this new movement across as well. You know how everybody wants to get yeah. a little bit of credit. Yeah. That's fine. I didn't get into that. But I saw Iñaki teaching this uh, cross on one and pretty much it's like uh, you are here dancing side to side and somehow you take your partner out of that bachata square. Right. I call it. And I was like, hmm, it is possible. There is. So then I came back to Sydney and then I talked to my, uh, my dance partner, Samantha, at the time. 
And then I say, listen, Sam, I saw this guy. He just, he's able to take the dance panel out of the bachata square. I don't know how he did it, but we're gonna find ways for me to get you out of the bachata square. And honestly, with Sam, we just, uh, she just helped me. I have like this idea in my mind and she helped me put it in different ways to say, okay, if you wanna take me out of the bachata square, how about you leave me this way? And how about we uh, try these other things? So then um, with Sam, we were able to create seven fun fundamentals now. I didn't know it was like kind of fundamentals, but seven fundamentals that it was, I could teach them, they were consistent, they were, could be done with different variations. So it wasn't just like my flavor, my, my styling, no, it was like foundations that I could teach them with different handholds, right. with different body position, but it was the same foundation. Yeah. So I created, she helped me to create seven of those things. And that was for me, we like, wow, now, now I can teach this as a something new that is still, yeah. and for me it was like, I still want to make sure it looks like bachata. Yeah. I don't wanna just create, have salsa patterns in bachata that looks like salsa. I want to make right. sure that it looks bachata, but now it has more intricate movement yeah. on the dance floor. So yeah, man, that's how um, Bachata Moderna started to develop and the name, that I used Bachata Moderna was given at your festival. That's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah, even yeah. we titled even we titled your workshops that way, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I loved me. it because you were the only one, or at least in our circle, uh, uh, not discrediting uh, uh, Iñaki, right? Uh, yeah. Because he's very he was very popular in Europe, and I met him mm -hmm. at the yeah, uh, yeah. Bachatando festival, uh, but. You were the, you were one of the few who got out of that circle, dude. It's like fuck. He just broke the rules right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's like whoa, you moved out. <laughs> it's like you, yeah. you got out of the square. What the hell is one doing? Yeah. But then I yeah. was looking at you because I was curious. Like, how did this? How did he structureize uh, what we call now bachata moderna? Because it mm -hmm. definitely was a traveling thing, but not just traveling within the square but traveling yeah. outside of the square, which was yeah. really cool. There was yeah. one time where I saw you turn her one, two, three, four, instead of going there, you went straight there on five, six, seven, eight. It's like, what the hell was that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I was so cool. I was, I was, I loved it. Like, oh my God, this is so cool now. <laughs> so my love for Bachata just grew. Again. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you did this, and I give you a lot of credit in really popularizing Bachata Moderna. Uh, and then, of course, we have Jorge Elizondo, who created the Bachata Fusion. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, he fused it with some other, like tango and everything. Yeah. In fact, yeah. Jorge is one of the uh, teachers who popularized Bachatango in the United States. Uh, him mm -hmm. and Camille, right? Mm -hmm. Give him mm -hmm. credit for that. And then Tony yeah. Lara is more of like the Italian style of Bachata back yeah. then. Uh, you guys were the only three doing that, of course. I was doing mix of everything. I think I was doing sensual. I just didn't know about it. <laughs> yeah. Because I was humping the, the, I was uh, humping wet. everyone. I remember <laughs> the wet. You would go down with the hips with your yeah. partner. Yeah. yeah. The hip roll. Uh, the hip yeah, roll, yeah. I, I think I was humping everyone, man. So like, <laughs> <laughs> and and then of course after that we went in our own way. I got into traditional. Uh, yeah. Jorge really permanently labeled his as uh, bachata moderna. And uh, no, not bachata, bachata fusion. fusion, and then you bachata moderna. And yeah. at that time, Tony was labeling Italian style bachata, yeah. which is obvious in his DVDs. Yeah, but yeah, that's uh, that's uh, a yeah. lot of history right there, dude. Do you I, do you get surprised sometimes, or do you get more of like a, a type of like a compliment in an indirect way? when dancers that you see now is like, oh, wait a minute, that's my move. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, 100%. 100%. And sometimes they don't know. Yeah. You know, because now it just became so popular with the uh, Madrid, uh, with the sensual style, they use the crosses everywhere. Phenomenal. I remember when I started teaching, when I was traveling and started teaching the crosses, people were like, fuck, no, man, it's too difficult. This yeah. is too complicated. Just yeah. teach us something more simple. So I had to just tone it down but there then are when three just the process take off and then people just getting comfortable with it yeah uh, i was like good you know what it doesn't <laughs> necessarily i had to i had to teach them but if all the people that just being inspired from my work yeah. and i teach them well, that's good 
It's same with me. Good. There are three moves I used to do centrally. You know that hip roll? Yeah, yeah. they do that. The uh, leg hooks, like the tango leg hooks, they do that. Yeah. And then uh, there's only one who copied this move and where I put you close here, I dip you in a frontal dip and mm -hmm. then turn at the same time. Mm -hmm. and then that. Daniel and Desiree copied that, but... <laughs> 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 they, <got> um, <laughs> they, they, they improved it and made it, and made it look better. <laughs> Dude, uh, Daniel and Desiree's video, I think I shared one where they included everything. Fusion, Moderna, Sensual, yeah. Traditional, and, and, yeah. and, 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 and they danced it with Romeo's song and Kiko Rodriguez. You know, that, mm, that song is very popular. Yeah. I shared it because I got excited. I was like, damn, now that's, yeah. you know, wow. That's, that's the, Robert Pachato yeah, right there in together. every sense of the word. Everything yeah. together. All the years of evolution together. I loved it. A lot yeah. of viewers didn't like it, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, going to a bit, uh, giving credit to what you say, at the Reno at the Festival, when I was there, uh, you asked me to do a demo yeah. with Camille. With Camille, yes. Typical, typical Rodney, you just came, hey, dude, bro, I want you to do a demo tonight. And uh, with Camille, she's here. And I was like, who's Camille? Oh, <laughs> Camille. And I was like, hi, I'm Juan. And she's like, hi, I'm Camille. And like, well, we need to do a demo. And she's <laughs> like, okay, what are we going to do? <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, and at that time, I was just starting to push my dancing career. So that was a very big moment for me to put myself in the center with yep. a brand new style and with a girl that I don't know yeah. in a festival that I don't know anybody as well. And you guys oh, did it that afternoon. You did the choreography that afternoon and performed it that night. <laughs> yeah, we did. A, a, we choreographed it the first 20 seconds because we have a short move from the chair and yeah. everything. And, and then the rest was just pure freestyle. Pure freestyle. Yeah, that's and, then, uh, that's and, and then that video created so many haters. Oh yeah! People hating me, hated yeah. me when it went, uh, it went viral on my channel. And guys, people were like, "You're destroying bachata because I was using as well a bachata song from an Italian singer." Mm -hmm. So it was not a traditional. It was more of like what we what we used to call techno bachata at that time. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like to call it experimental bachata. That was experimental <laughs> bachata. You know? So I, that was me using an experimental techno bachata song, doing new bachata steps. Yeah. So man, I got a lot of love, a lot of haters, but that video helped me to become popular. Because a lot of people were saying, oh, this is shit, this is yeah. crazy, this is wrong. But then they were sharing the video, pointing yeah. the wrong things, but then people would say, oh, I actually like it. And then yeah. they start following me. That's yeah. how like, uh, I give credit to Carlos uh, R Rufino. Remember <laughs> the biggest role in bachata? He trolled me because of that video. He started to troll me, but then, thanks to him, he increased my following. Popularity, my yeah. Whew, by a lot. So I used to hate the guy, but then I was like, please keep doing it. Keep doing it I, because you are exposing my, my work to more people. You know, I, you know, I met him in person and, and became good friends for, for like a minute there. Um, <laughs> for like a minute. <laughs> he is, you know, in person, uh, it, it, he is definitely a troll. He's a very good guy in person. It's just mm. that my, in my psychological, in my psychology expertise, I would say, is that he only does that in Facebook uh, uh, because he has certain goals, you know? Uh, and he almost met that when he became friends of mine because I wanted him to teach at my festival. I wanted him to uh, walk his talk. You know, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, because a lot of people, a lot of trolls in Facebook, they only talk, but they can't walk. I feel like the trolls were on at the time were on YouTube because YouTube was more there was you didn't have a proper profile page, so yeah. you could be more anonymous and right. definitely just right talk so wrong about everybody. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, he, he, he's uh, he's a good guy in person. Uh, I don't agree with him on in the social media, and I told him that, like, dude, I can't defend you there because one time he criticized one of my attendees at festivals of 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 uh, uh fat shaming and i was like dude you know you can't do that you yeah know? It's like i don't agree with what you're doing he was like so anyways uh now uh juan 2020 mm -hmm. before 2020. pandemic 
you yeah. had you have a thriving dance studio in the mm. center of it all in Sydney. You're in downtown, bro. You showed me yeah. that studio. Studio. It's not that big. It's not that small, but it's mm -hmm. perfect for that location. Yeah. Oh, the location is beautiful. I'm like two hundred meters away from the Central Park in Sydney. Yeah. And just yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's really good. I've been there since 2011. Yeah, so you, you haven't uh, left that place, huh? I haven't left that place. I haven't left that place because the location was always the, the greatest thing. Oh, the, the space, location is perfect, dude. Yeah, the space, tricky because it's a small, but the location was just so, so good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we used to get a lot of the people that work in the city to come to the studio. Yeah, right away. true. Yeah. Uh, do you, um, I know you went to Malaysia, right? Uh, mm -hmm. For a festival, correct? Yes. How yeah. was that like? Because those were one of the first festivals in Asia. Uh, yeah, I went to the Malaysian Salsa Festival. I think I think I went for the third festival. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think I went for the third one, and then I went to the fourth one. I think I went for three years in in a row. Um, yeah. It was good, man. The vibe, uh, people over there in Malaysia and Singapore and Vietnam, they just love Latin dancing. They just they want more more knowledge so i was i went to the festival and then i was able to organize uh, different trips to other countries to continue teaching so yeah it was always, i always find them very very friendly and very eager to learn more that's good uh, yeah. now uh, let's get to the issue of what were you feeling like when you were being criticized uh, during the early days of of innovating bachata i call it innovating bachata mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. because yeah. Uh, all of us as professional dancers, uh, regard, uh, uh, it, depending on each background, whether it's ballet, ballroom, what have you, salsa, uh, we tend to innovate what we grew up on, what we grew up on mm -hmm. as students, you know. Uh, and so what were your thought process like when you have critics like that, you know? Oh, man. Um, when that video I was telling you, it started to go popular on YouTube and I started to receive a lot of love, which was made, made me feel really good. Yeah. But then I started receiving, you know, one negative comment. I was like, OK, and then two negative comments and then three, four, five, six. And suddenly it's a lot. <laughs> and then you have like Carlos Rufino just telling you that you're a clown, that you're stealing money from people, that you're destroying the culture. And like, yeah. it, it definitely makes you question uh, your work. You know, and if you're doing, if you're doing things right, it definitely just gets in you. But for me, that was a, a good a growth a process. Yeah. Because I develop a thick skin. Right. And now I know the the more successful you are, the more people are gonna be, the the, the more critics you're gonna have. Yeah. So that is a a way to measure your success as well. The more critics you have, because you're doing something really good. Yeah. So once I put that my mindset into that one, I accepted all the negative comments and actually I read them and I would say, OK, try to understand where they come from. Some yeah. of them will be just pure hatred. Some of them will actually give me some feedback on it. Right. And then I will take that and then in, put it into my bachata modern style because I always want to uh, stay true to the bachata essence, you yes. know, so I will use to incorporate a uh, it moves from other styles, but I would say like I had to change the shaping and I had to change the, the, the timing. Yeah. So it looks bachata. Otherwise, it's going to look like, a, let's say, a ballroom move with the bachata timing, which is not yeah. what I want. I want it to look bachata with the right timing. So they helped me. They helped me. They helped me grow a lot and to polish the style that, I, that I'm known for. It's so then thing. when people yeah. see it, they say it's bachata. You know, yeah. it's just bachata. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I like about what bachata had become, okay, um, mm. because bachata was only dance in the Dominican Republic at that time. Let's let's get technical here and let's get to the root and let's get to the root and the modern plate. Let's see if you agree with me, okay? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So let me use that because I have my side too. It would be good to yeah. compare. Yeah. It was yeah. only dance at that time in the Dominican Republic, not to mention in the in the rural rural areas uh -huh. only not really in the capital because you know yeah. uh, uh some elites really didn't like it not to mention they only yeah. love merengue okay the thing is what happened is that let's take up the word bachata bachata at that time 
was not about the dance. Never. Mm -hmm. It was about hanging out, having parties with your families and friends. They call that bachata. Yeah. They call that yeah. bachata, okay? Yeah, I agree. What do you call the music at that time? It was not bachata. Musica de amarge, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It was musica de amarge. You know, you know it because it's all sad songs. You know, yeah. somebody's yeah, trying yeah. to kill themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Drink, drink away. Yeah, drink away. And drink so away, you sorrow. That chata party, as they call it. Yeah. Not only they were drinking, they were dancing to rigaton, they were dancing to merengue, they were dancing to salsa, they were dancing to bolero, they were dancing to bachata, everything. And they called that bachata. Okay. Yeah. Of course, it certainly evolved to bachata, as we call it now, the music, okay? But the dance at that time, bachata was just a bolero-ish, mm -hmm. okay? In fact, they didn't call it bolero. They, they call it bolero, but they didn't call it bachata. They just called them, hey, the dancers there, you know? So now, when it became apparent to some other countries liking that, that dance, yeah. they cannot help it but put their own flavor uh, yeah. their own culture in that dance. You just, you can't help it. Whether it's Filipino bachata, American bachata, Ecuadorian yeah. bachata, Australian bachata, you know, you yeah. name it, you know. You can't help it because that's just the way it is. Now, when I look at bachata moderna, bachatango, bachata fusion, sensual, I don't call this evolution, bro. I call them innovation. Because mm -hmm. if, I if I stick to the word evolution, uh, bachata moderna is an evolution of bachata. Bachata sensual is an evolution of bachata. There's got to be a very concrete, traceable, original structure of the traditional bachata to evolve on something, right? I mean, yeah. when they say we evolved from monkey, yeah, okay, we, I, I see it, you know, we, we, you know, it's just a little <laughs> bit hard, okay, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, the Neanderthal man, the, uh, the Peking man, you know, we, yeah. we, we go to that history. So it's innovation. So mm -hmm. when you call sensual bachata, bachata moderna, bachata vision, traditional bachata, as bachata, yeah. that makes sense because in the old days, the name bachata is yeah, it was everything. Yeah. You know what? I'm gonna. What do you think? I, I agree with everything that you mentioned back in the island. Yes, that's how it was. Uh, but I like to add that the music got got out out of the island. Indeed, and yes. especially in the United States, and thanks to Aventura, you know, and Extreme, they are the ones that uh, made it popular with to the young people, to the to the youngster. So we were giving this beautiful music, but there was no guidelines for how to dance it. Yes. We just we just have like the, the four steps and that's it. And plus it was a very romantic feeling. So that's I feel like a people just created something to dance to the beautiful music that was given to us. Yeah. And then uh, when and I'm sure I mean the internet wasn't popular at, at the time, so the Dominicans couldn't see how we were dancing their music. There was no no connection there until like the internet became popular and then the yes. Dominicans saw what we were how we were dancing the music and they were like, yeah. what, what are you guys doing? That's not how it is done. And we were like, well, yeah. we want to dance it. So we just incorporated what we came from, you know, yeah. Yeah. music. And so it was not like a, we never wanted to step away from the Dominic, Dominicanos and how they dance it, but we just wanted to dance to the music. We didn't have any guidelines. Yeah. So we all just tried to put our knowledge in it and just to enjoy the music. No. And that's, yeah. that, that's exactly what happened. And that's what's happening. That's what happened in Spain. That's yeah. what happened in Italy, Australia, yeah. and you name it, United States for that matter. Uh, yeah. And of course, if you look at now because of the social media, if you look at the Dominican Republic, they started doing side to side, traveling side to side. They didn't mm -hmm. do that. <laughs> now they start doing that now. Yeah. Although when they social this, I don't see them doing it. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I love the man. I love the innovation, call it evolution, whatever it I is. It. I love I the growth of bachata yeah. to what it is now because uh, it has is it, it it's becoming a more complex dance. It's not as simple as one, two, three, tap, five, six, seven, tap, and that's it. Now, now you know bachata. Yeah. Now, there is yeah. a lot more. You know the movement to make it look sensual. You have the body movement to make it look sensual. The footwork 
to incorporate the Dominican part of it. Yeah. The turn patterns to incorporate the bachata moderna side of it, and then all these other influences for other dances. Uh, I I enjoy it. Like I in my in my studio, even though I'm known for bachata moderna, I don't just solely teach bachata moderna. Good. Because like you mentioned, the video. From I noticed Dominican, you teach as well correct? now too. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I always say the music will tell you which style to bring to it. And actually, it's kind of it's kind of good right now because there's just so many styles of bachata that you just dance bachata. <laughs> That's it. You just dance in bachata, and then the music tells you to put a little essential, to put a bit of football Dominican, yeah. to do some nice turn patterns. So you cannot just dance one style on its own. It just becomes too, let's put it, too simple. You, yeah. you have to bring now everything else into one. So I think we're getting back now. So we started with bachata. We created all these different uh, uh, styles, variation, but now we're just going, we're putting everything together into bachata once again. Yeah, once again, you know, and yeah. that's a good thing because it, the, the, the testament to that is that video I was telling you about Daniel and Desiree. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if they knew what they were getting into when they did the choreography or even, even if that was a choreography, which is they were just winging it. It yeah. was the representation of all yeah. bachata and its modernity, you know, um, yeah. and I loved it. I loved it because the flavor was there, the structure was there, the, yeah. the fanciness was there, you know. Yeah. I loved it. I know, man. Getting back I, to your point about, getting back to your point, I uh -huh. agree with the point where you were saying that when, when uh, a foreigner tried to learn the bachata and they learn it and they bring it to their country, they can't help but put in their influences mm. and whatnot. Now, yeah. you know, to my friends at the traditional part, because I, some of you are really 100% traditional and I, I don't hold that against you. Mm -hmm. I am 100% traditional when it comes to uh, preference of social dancing, you know, not, yeah. not that, although I don't mind dancing sensual, if a lady would ask me to dance sensual with her, I'm okay. I'm not going to say no, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. But during that time, the Dominicans, when that music was introduced, Musica de Amarque, when they're trying to figure out the moves, they were getting their influence. What were their influences? Cuban son, bolero, mm -hmm. some merengue right there. So you could tell that the original moves right there were bolero structure and son structure, and that they mm -hmm. borrowed that from. It's not, oh, yeah. it's not because bachata just came to be, and all oh, of the yeah. movies are really bachata. And that's what, that's what we're trying to say, ladies and gentlemen, me and Juan, that's what we're trying to say that with the influence that we have, we would somehow fuse it to what we're dancing at the time. So, mm. Yeah, we all took our influences, but the was good thing about us pioneers is that we wanted to make sure it looks bachata. Indeed. indeed, just, indeed. just don't just take something for another dance and then just leave it as it is. Yeah. But we have to make sure that the shape looks bachata. And that's the, that's the I always say like a, some people want to give credit like these moves come from soup. Well, actually that move comes from tango that soup used it and now Bachata Central is using it. And I'm sure tango got that move from something else from, and then that dance yeah. that from something else. Yeah. So I always say like the, move, the moves are used and reused by all the styles. You just need to make sure that you give it the right shaping and the right timing yeah. to look yeah. that style of dance that you want to represent. Yep, I agree. Yeah. And uh, uh, labeling, what do you think of labeling? Uh, labeling, I think, is good to represent the style. So just to give people the right idea what they are watching or what they are learning. Especially um, if you're going a little bit more to the experimental side of, side of things. Mm. So that's that's thing like a, I've seen some instructors teaching uh, moves that are not bachata with bachata music, especially with the bachata remixes because the bachata remixes gives you a lot more freedom in freedom. that sense to yeah, integrate yeah. more of the hip hop, R&B feeling. Yeah. And then when they say, come, you know, learn bachata, I feel like they need to add some extra labeling to indicate, yes, this is bachata, but this is more of a, this style of bachata. I can live with that. I agree with that. Uh, now, let me ask you a very specific question. Mm -hmm. Which do you prefer and why? Traditional bachata 
name or Dominican bachata? <clears throat> I I will say um, <laughs> good question. Good question. You know, I would say like to to kind of respect the people. I will say Dominican bachata at the culture, but however, it's more popular just to call it traditional bachata. At the same time, uh, how we call it Cuban salsa. It's a specific type of, of salsa. I'm fine, Indeed. it's called it Dominican bachata. Yeah. You know, even though they say, well, they will say bachata is bachata, but you know what, let's just, it has a uniqueness, the people that dance from the island. So I'm happy to call it Dominican bachata without it taking away that they are the creators of bachata. Yeah. I. Uh... I know that sometimes I call it traditional and sometimes my colleagues, our colleagues call it traditional and they prefer it to go yeah. like such. I disagree, dude. Uh, you know, this is just me, ladies and gents. Um, yeah, I, what, I what, what no whatsoever. I disagree to call it traditional bachata uh -huh. because they don't know what that is. Okay. If you call it Dominican bachata, this is to identify and give credit. Yeah to what Dominican does, the way they dance, you know? Uh, yeah. Because if you call it traditional, then you have to dance bolero. But then, but then I had the debate that yeah. people, the people saying like, what do, you, what do you even call it Dominican bachata? It should be just bachata. You call it Dominican bachata too, distinguished. Yeah. The differences. That's really yeah. the answer for it. To distinguish to dif the differences between the other styles now, you know? Yes. Oh, um, I, I agree with that, yes. Yeah. To distinguish. Yeah. Now, um, I don't want to call it traditional because if you say traditional, you have to dance bolero. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. so um, that's the reason I call it. I, I know I, I had some debate with this with some of our friends. I call it Dominican bachata. That's just the way it is. You know, yeah. it, you can't deny it. It came from that's the way they dance in the Dominican Republic. And yeah. that's the one. By the way, I got to give credit to our bachata uh, dominican bachata artist the dominican bachata artist or that style so are you talking about the dancers or the now. they're as popular as sensual oh yeah 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 but uh the pioneers the one that made dominican style popular were troy and georgette it is indeed we cannot yeah. deny this yeah i have to i have to be up front because I've been trying to decode Dominican bachata for a long, long time. Even when I was in Dominican Republic for the first time, <clears> I could not decode it. Now, until I keep watching Troy and Georgette, especially the Dominican barbershop. Mm, oh yeah, those pop, yeah, those videos were popular at that time. Everybody course, can say, we need to I was looking at Georgette, I wasn't looking at Troy, dude. <laughs> you were looking at his, at his boldness. <laughs> like, I wanna be like him. <laughs> Which is, which is glasses too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, oh, well, I love it because, you know, he would dance and the audience is there. He would turn and put Georgette's back into the audience. Like, okay, I see yeah. what you're doing, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, you know, it's, it's, it's good to go back to the history to see the, oh, I love the, it. the moments that influence, you know, movement, movement and changes. Oh, I've been getting, right now, I've been getting into old style uh, songs of merengue, bro. Yeah. Going, going back to Giovanni Polanco and all of those, those pioneers, yeah. it, it's a little different and there's some flavor to it that I really love. So I've been getting into merengue, uh, not necessarily the moderna type of music, but mm -hmm. I like the old ones. It's, it's, yeah. I've been getting into that lately because I feel that if you know bachata, you gotta know merengue. That's just the way it is, you know. Sure, just like sure, you know salsa, sure. just like you know salsa, yeah. you gotta know cha cha cha. Otherwise, they will yeah. kill you. <laughs> so it just shows your age, man. All the, you know, you master something, then you're yeah. like, okay, now I need to know the original beginnings, the roots, and then you go way back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we all do that, man. But that's good. So, I haven't followed my merengue, so you can educate me. The merengue is, you know, it's just. Yeah, I, I just love the fluidity of it and the simplicity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the most simple dance is the best dance, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree um, with that. What do you organize nowadays besides the Sydney Bachata Festival? So uh, national events, I have the Sydney Bachata Festival and then I was part of the Baron Latin Fiesta, 
Byron, yes. oh, okay. Yeah, so that is another national event. However, I stepped down of that one uh, in 2018. Oh, okay, okay. 2018, I stepped down because I find that uh, running my dance studio was taking me uh, a lot of time and then um, the Bachata Festival too. And then yeah. I, was, I started to organize a lot, a lot of more local events. Okay. So I have big, four big parties in Sydney. One nice. every two months. Yeah, so the four big parties in Sydney, plus I have two monthly parties in Sydney as well. So bro, so, on, a, on a good night in Sydney, okay, just Sydney mm -hmm. alone, on a one particular party, on the best night, how many people shows up? Oh, well, and, uh, I'm telling you for the, my four big ones, I used to get like around 400 people. Nice. At the, at the parties. And how, but much those are like a, how much do you charge at the door? Uh, it, well, I'm talking about these uh, special events. Oh, okay, uh, gotcha, we, I gotcha, I yeah, gotcha, yeah. These special events. Now for the uh, weekly parties, uh, my parties, uh, one party was at my studio, so we were limited by the capacity. So what I would say yeah. like a, 100, 150 people will come through the door. And then I have another party in a different venue and we used to get, yeah, 300 people nice. coming. Easy, yeah. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, um, um, uh, it's a great, I mean, did you think that you were going to organize other festivals besides Sydney Festival, Sydney Bachata Festival? I didn't, you know, I didn't think I was going to be a promoter. <laughs> I learned how to be a promoter, how to talk to people. And, and you know, as a promoter, you go to a restaurant, any new restaurant, you just like... Yeah, you do. Oh, oh. You, yeah. just, you just picture, okay, if I remove all the tables, how many meters do I have? How many couples can I fit? Mmm, idea. So everywhere I go, I mean, just always, always look. Yeah, I yeah. could use it. I You're not the it. only one. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to become a promoter, that's exactly what you do every day. If yeah, everywhere eh? you go... I was like, okay, uh -huh. it's just like a photographer. Everywhere you go, yeah. you got to bring that camera, right? <laughs> uh -huh. and like, okay, and then I write it down, and then I have it there in the back of my mind. I'm looking for a new venue. Or I even just like to venues just to have them ready in case I need something, the opportunity. Yeah. Yes. Another so. secret of mine is that whenever me and my wife, or just me, staying at a certain hotel, yeah. if I like the hotel, I'm going to talk to the manager right there and then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So most of the hotels that I'm doing my event at, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, here in Australia, the hotels at the time, when I started the festival, the Cine Bachata Festival, the hotels were not interested in hosting this sort of event. They made it very difficult. Like, I, you know, when we used to share information, you used to say, oh, the, the hotel will give me a discount and then the ballroom if I bring that many people. In Sydney, we're like, uh, no, you bring that many people? No, we're not gonna give you nothing. Like, what about the ballroom? Oh, you still need to pay you 20, 20 grand. And like, uh, what, what, I'm gonna bring you people. And they were not interested at all. So that's why uh, Australia started to develop the culture of having the festival in a venue and then the accommodation in a different place. That's the same because way in Europe. We're not helping. That's the same way in Europe because Europe hotels are all also tough to deal with. The only, uh, yeah. the only person who got away with that uh, in the early days is Tony Lara. Uh, you know, he had that sexy central festival yeah. in, in the uh, hotel in the airport area of uh, Heathrow, you know. Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, that was yeah. the only time. And then, of course, uh, you got Pablo Vilches, uh, Bachatea and all that with, with the hotel. But I yeah. tell you, they will always have problem with the hotels because yeah. Europe is very hard to deal with. Yeah, now it's different. Now the hotels are helping more, but yeah. still not as much as the culture that you guys have. You well, know, especially after this company. pandemic, they want your business. Oh. So <sighs> Man, guys, that, that would know. be an idea. <laughs> Bro, for yeah. Sydney Bachata Festival next year or the other year, you, gotta, so, you guys got to take action with that because that's when the hotel needs anyone. Yeah, yeah. We actually move out west. Uh, here in Sydney, they, call, they have the RSLs. Yeah. You know yeah. where uh, where we had the first bachata festival? Remember yes. that the venue? Yeah. yeah. So that's in the that, was that in a school or university or something, right? That, that is uh, the first year was an RSL. Yeah. That is a, a private venues, but they're managed by the state to uh, to give a place for the people to go and just uh, go out at night. Oh, okay. Put it that way. Uh, usually, it's mostly due for the uh, people who went to the army, 
the, the reservist to have a place kind of to hang out. Now picture that, that place uh, times 10, 10 times 10. So we have one that is a little bit outside of Sydney that is huge. It's Can you divide huge. it? Can you divide the rooms? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we good. used it. We used it for uh, two years, and it's just amazing, man. It's just a big bubble. We have different rooms, three dancing rooms, uh, four worship spaces, and it's close to a hotel. So it, it is adjacent to a hotel as well. So we they are, they are our partners now for the festival. Man, uh, we I have love the idea. It. I love the idea of a hotel. You know me, bro. I it, my yeah. events are in the fucking hotel. You know. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah. It's oh, oh, it's better to have everything <laughs> in one place because it creates more community, especially oh, yeah. at night. Before and after the parties, you have that community sense. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I agree. What do you think of? Uh... Okay, so before we used to party until two a.m. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the festivals, right? Even in Rio, yeah. we did that until 2 a.m. Okay. Yeah. Now it's extended to 6 or 7 a.m. Yeah. What do you What do you think of this format? Is it Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? I'm gonna tell you my opinion after yours. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it all depends, to be honest, of the city restrictions and the hotel restrictions. Right. In Australia, forget about party. You can't do it, huh? Until five or six a.m. The oh, venues really? won't allow you. Oh wow! Yeah, they won't allow it. It has been. A, it has. They are a lot more loose right now, but we could only run the venues until two a.m. That's it. We oh. couldn't. We couldn't go more because the city you would just put a lock. They say it's not a lockdown, but just rules that no venue can open until two past two a.m. And if you want to open past two a.m., then you need to apply, and the application was just way too much effort. So that's why we never wanted, we, we couldn't push it. Now, this venue that I'm mentioning, uh, with the new regulations and everything, we can have parties until 4 a.m. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, then we can have 4 a.m. But so for Sydney, uh, we always went in it. For Australia, we always went in it, but we just couldn't do it because um, just the city restrictions. So we couldn't do, do nothing about it. So when we hear about United States and Europe having parties until 4 or 6 a.m., I will tell you, well, right now I'm older, now I'm a family man, so I don't, I don't look forward to stay up till that early in the morning. <laughs> but when, if I was younger, I would have loved to, to be able to party till that. Well, but, congratulations on your, on your newborn, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, is six months. A, is it a boy or a girl? A boy. Uh, how, old, how, boy. how many months is he now? Six months. Uh, and the, and eight. Team, how yeah. does it feel like when that boy came out, man? How how did you feel? Oh man, it was it was a beautiful feeling. It was just at the beginning of the lockdown here in Sydney. Oh yeah. Yeah. The yeah. lockdown for us started for my school. We closed the school on the 16th of March. He came on the 18th of March. Well, so that was perfect. Now you got all the it was, time. <laughs> it was the perfect timing. I yeah. have no events. I used to be out at night on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, because there were events or nights that I was part of, or you had, you know, you had to attend as a promoter, you had to support. Mm. So, yeah, so suddenly I didn't have any of the, my night of obligations. So perfect time for me to be a, to be a dad. Perfect time, right? Um, going back to the point about the six o'clock, you know, yeah. uh, I sort of followed Tony Lara because he always has his party until 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. And and going to his festivals, there are no yeah. gaps. That, that's people dancing from 10 uh, p.m. all the way to 6 a.m. nonstop. There are no gaps. Yeah. However, in the United States, okay, in my observations, with my festivals and other festivals, the problem with extending until 6, you got a gap. Meaning, okay, uh, well, we're gonna, party until, we're gonna party until 6, so, let's drink into my room until like one o'clock. Mm, yeah, yeah, that happened, yes. Guess what happened? So yeah, they yeah, had yeah, these room happened. parties. While they're having these room parties, that ballroom is almost practically empty. Yeah. And then yeah. they come in, they miss the DJ playing they like, you know? And so it's yeah. like a mess. And it's like, I had, so I had to rethink that. So uh -huh. if this ever happened again, I'm gonna have to rethink it, whether I'm gonna implement a six, or make it early so that all the dancers are there because they know the deadline yeah. of the dance. 
You know? That's true. I never experienced that problem here in Sydney because we couldn't have a past 2 a.m. So, but sure. yeah, when I went to your festival for the 10th anniversary, yeah, when you put me to DJ, I think 4 a.m., I was like, dude, can I request an early set? And he's like, nobody's going to be there to hear your music. And I was like, no, put me at 11. Yeah. Because for me, the midnight, the 11 to midnight set is the, is the big one. Yeah, know? yeah. And then you're like, dude, nobody's going to come to dance with you. And yeah. it's true. The, the ballroom was empty. <laughs> people were at the rooms having parties. See, people took it for granted. It worked for a while. And then all of a sudden you see some gaps on certain yeah. hours. It's like, mm, I don't like that, you know, because, mm, yeah. you know, it's either that you close it at 2 a.m. Here's my perfect idea. Okay. Okay. You got, let's say four rooms, right? Kizamba, bachata, salsa, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Close it at 2 a.m. And then after two, you have what we call after party in one room where you include everything. <laughs> yeah, good idea. Yeah. 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 Me and yeah. Uh, uh, Carlos Sinta and Ismael had been trying to propose this one room type of party where everybody yeah. can dance. I was like, what about the people who prefers this? What about the people because they can't dance this? And then they said, well, there's workshops. They got to learn it. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, yeah, that's a tricky one uh, <laughs> because there are parties, like a, a, there are times that you want to just and dance your favorite style and get better at it with social dancing. I'm yeah. one of those people. I'm one of those. Yeah. <laughs> and then there are times when you just want to socialize with people. Yeah. You don't care the style. You just want to have your drink, get uh, to know other people, just have fun dancing. So you, I think we need to look at for those times, times that people just want to dance their dance style and get crazy and improve. And then there are times when you just want to socialize and just get to know more people and just relax. So the concept right, of brother. the after party, to have that, that room, that's good because yeah. the purpose is not there for you to have the best dancers. The I purpose agree. is to socialize and get to know other people in the community. I agree. Um, all right. So where can they find you? What are your websites nowadays? Because I know you have certain websites where you wrote articles there. Here yeah. There for some good info. Yeah. So that was my bachateros.com website. That and what I have. Yeah. Uh, Is it still on? It's still on. It focuses more to sell my DVDs. Okay. My, okay. My instructional videos. Uh, I use it more for that. Uh, the articles, uh, they are still there as an archive. As an archive. Okay. So okay. It has a lot of the history there. Yeah. Uh, so that's my like to buy my DVDs, bachateros.com. But then um, definitely find me people in, in Instagram. Okay. On my uh, just search for my name Juan Ruiz or on YouTube as well. Like, I always put my videos in YouTube. Juan uh, Ruiz, yeah. It's a good, good good library. And then on Facebook. And find Facebook me. And then Juan my Ruiz school. also, right? Yeah. My what's school the name, is what's the name of your studio? My studio is called Tropical Soul Dance Studio. Tropical Soul Dance Studio, Dance ladies studio. and gents in, in yeah. uh, Sydney, if you want to find my friend here. Okay, here are two last questions. Your All right. top five ultimate bachata musician. Musicians, okay, number one, Romeo Santos, without a doubt. Okay. Especially with his latest work. Ooh, amazing. Uh, his yeah. latest work, you notice it's not putting out any album right now because it's still being enjoyed. You know? yeah. yeah, it's just, oh, that just blew. He just put, brought back the traditional flavor. He with kicked the mother. everyone's ass, dude. It was like Aventura at that time. You yep. know, when Aventura brought the music, and went, oh my God. And then Romeo Santos did it 10 years later. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, for me, that's, that's, the, that's the best one. I do enjoy the music of Luis Vargas. Luis Vargas. And, Luis Vargas, and then the Anthony Santos as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. On the traditional side. I, those are yeah. the two ones that I enjoy the most. And then for the newer, the newer ones, uh, I like Daniel Santa Cruz. Of course. Because yeah. uh, he creates music for other singers too. So, yeah, and I like that. And he doesn't get the credit that he... he no, he doesn't really he get a lot of credit, but I like I yeah. like his songs. Oh, yeah. I learned, and a lot of the songs that you like from other singers, yeah. he has created them. You know, he has given to them. Yeah. So I like that because of what he brings to the community. 
and then the um, and then I do like a uh, Grupo Extra as well. I agree with that. I'll be very uh, hopefully they won't get angry at me, but I think uh, they um they just are repeating the same formula that they have done before. So a few years ago, fuck, they just keep you yeah. know they have the the anthem, the song that is an anthem. They have the song with the guitar. They have the song that is fast. They have the song that is slow. Every album, but then every album is like is like that. Yeah. You know, they can kind of repeat that. So uh, I hopefully don't get shot for that. But yeah, but I do love. <laughs> no, it's a good, extra. it's a good constructive thing. I'm sure, I'm sure Fidel is, is, uh, Fidel is a very creative guy. So I'm sure he's, yes. you know, he's going to get into something, you know? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that. And then uh, another, and that sing, uh, singer that I think that was going to be, um, he's the triple trifecta, as I call it, is Danny J. Danny Jay, you really like Danny J, huh? <laughs> the guy can sing, the guy can dance, and he's a good looking guy. <laughs> and you don't have that, you know, Romeo Santos, good looking guy, he can yeah. sing, he cannot dance. Yeah. Uh, Danny J can do the three. He, Danny J could be teaching workshops, bachata workshops to, in congresses, and he would look better than some other professionals. I got to tell you a story about Danny J. There was a man who messaged me on Facebook before my Las Vegas event. Yeah. I say, hey, Rodney, my name is blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I, you know, I happen to be in Vegas. I'd like to go to your festival uh, 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 and, uh, and, and check it out. And, and here I am, because I, I didn't know him. I was like, sure, just come in, uh, you know, passes this, how much much? And this is like, okay. Yeah. And then yeah. he came in. <laughs> Somebody told me it was Danny J. Dude, oh, yeah. I was, my face, I'm like, what the fuck? What the <laughs> And yeah. then when I saw Danny J like a couple of year, couple of years ago in the Bay Area, it's like I went to him, it's like, uh, Danny, I'd like to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Officially I, apologize. I'd like to apologize that I ignored you in Las Vegas. I, I had no idea. It, you know, it, it it didn't cross my mind. It's like now I know I my apologies, like don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> oh, uh. It's he's funny how, how it goes, right? Yeah. So so anyway, um, it's good hanging out with you, bro. We went for like hour and a half. That's unusual, right? Wow. <laughs> right? Indeed. Yeah, that was good. That was very entertaining conversation, man. That was good. I mean, we even had our, our partner in crime, Jorge, uh, join us and some other uh, 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 great people here, you know, as I was looking at it. Oh, my God, you know. Yeah. Even even Andrea for a minute was was watching there, so... Uh, uh, that means ace. Uh, but uh, anyways, uh, uh, I gathered that next year you guys are not going to do the festival or you're still going to do it? Uh, we don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to plan uh, two weeks in advance with this pandemic. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. So or even three months know. in advance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just don't know. I was going to say like um, for all the viewers there that you have a chat with uh, Jorge and me about the history of the Bachata Festival. Yes, we United did, States. we did, yeah. Reshare it, man, because that's, that's so much history that's that history, it's yeah. such a nice conversation that people should know how things started. So, yeah. definitely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's on my channel. Uh, it's titled The Making of the First Bachata Festival in the USA. Uh, and uh, Jorge Elizondo is in that podcast as well as Juan Ruiz. And we really went back there and yeah. Name names and, and, and all of the details that you can name of yeah. people. All know the history. Is. Yeah. Yeah. And how we then he went to develop his Dallas Bachata Festival as well. And then you know, Jorge told me before after we organized San Francisco, right? Reno first and then San Francisco after real. I will never organize a festival, man. This is too hard. <laughs> <laughs> now Jorge then, had Dallas and yeah. Uh, Beijing or China? In in Shanghai. 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 I think Shanghai. Shanghai, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know. Eh? I've yeah. never been to China. I want to go, dude. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I want to go. I want to go. And you on go, your man. 15th anniversary, I'm there. On your 15th okay. anniversary, um, you know, I, I always feel compelled to go to your festival because I give your festival a lot of credit for making me an international teacher. Because after that, I got gigs all over the world. Ah, cool, that festival, man. yeah. Ah, so cool. I give a lot of credit with that. I also give a lot of credit to Sky for hooking me up. 
because I went there a week in advance, if you remember. Mm -hmm. She hooks me up on all of the classes. I teach classes all over the place. <laughs> ah, cool. Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah. All right, Awan, it's great talking to you. Say hi to Indeed. Gabby. Gabby uh, and Thomas. My yeah. son is Thomas, so. <laughs> Um, until next time, we'll talk again. I'm sure uh, there are a lot of things to talk, to talk more about. Maybe the next time I bring you, it would be a panel uh, about mm -hmm. certain issues in, in our community. And, and we'll Sounds go good. that way. Uh, uh, I'll try to post this tonight and, and tag you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you like this content, make sure you like it. You, you press like. And if you have not subscribed, on the right side on YouTube, just subscribe. Thank you, Juan Opa. Ruiz. Ciao, my friend. Take care. Ciao.